Right. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to episode 81, Podchat Live episode 81. And welcome back to those of you who were perhaps with us uh, yesterday evening for episode 80, a, an incredibly fun and informative uh, session on chill blains. Um, we, they say they, they say never to do a sequel, but people who say that, I, I say, have never seen the film John Wick. And here we are with our sequel. Uh, and this is Chill Blains 2, or, or our, perhaps it better thought of as an appendix to last night. Um, and mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about the specific uh, associations, correlations, manifestations. I'm not sure of the right word to use here, but the, the, the reports of COVID toes. So these chill blain or perneo-like lesions that we have seen um, sort of reported in, in the literature with the increasing sort of amounts um, and coronavirus. So uh, we are really excited to have our first ever guest from South Africa with us, Nadia Demsky. Hi, Nadia. Thanks for joining us. Um, Hi, Ian. Thank you. <laughs> quick, but by way of really brief introduction, Nadia got her bachelor's degree and her master's degree from the University of Johannesburg. I think I'm right in saying she's still in Johannesburg. She sits on the executive... <laughs> Executive Committee of the National Podiatry Association of South Africa. And as we will come on to talk about towards the end, she has just submitted a PhD proposal on this exact topic, um, chill blain like lesions in, in coronavirus. So we look forward to her telling us as much as she's happy to tell us about that toward the end. Um, but we'll start, if we can, just by talking about um, the, the phenomena that's occurred over the last few months and the way that it seems to have exploded. And I should probably state fairly quickly just in case people are listening to this after the fact, you know, weeks or even months after the fact that today, time of recording, it's Friday the 19th of June 2020. I wanted to make that clear because this, this seems to be changing rather rapidly, this evidence, the amount of it and what it's saying. So I think we should probably date stamp what we're saying today and say it's relevant as of today, but it may not be in, in, in future times. So, um, Nadia, has it surprised you, uh, I'm guessing this is an area of interest for you given that you've just submitted your PhD, but has it surprised you just how much research we have seen in, in, in such a relatively short period of time? I've counted at, at least, and I know I've missed some, but I've counted at least 15 published papers in the last 16 weeks. So that's almost one a week. Now, I've had papers under review for months, years before. So what's going on here? Is it just that the interest is captured? Is it where the funding's going? What's going on? I think it's it's twofold, Ian. It's obviously funding is a very big thing because you won't do research if you don't have any funding. And because this is a novel virus, and unfortunately what we, we do see with, with all of these uh, research publications is they're all in preprint. So they, they tend to push the research through a preprint so that the information is out there quickly, but uh, I've seen in the last couple of weeks about two or three published papers from The Lancet, and we all know that's a very big journal, uh, being retracted because of the update of, of what we see with this virus. This virus is fascinating and scary at the same time. So I think that's why we're seeing a hell of a lot of, of papers being published just so that we can keep up to date with it. And like you say, we're saying today is the 19th. Probably in a week or two, this chat will be outdated. <laughs> but actually, I also do, I do, I notice, also do, I do I, notice that some of those publications, some of those publications you know, we're getting feedback. Where am I getting feedback from? I think it's you, Craig. Uh, I don't think so. Oh, okay, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll... I'm not getting any. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Look, I'll just keep going. I, I do notice that some of the um, publications are, are, are letters to the editor, which normally have a faster track anyway. There's still, still yes. no guarantee of their their quality. And as you said, when you look at how many, I mean, especially the, the two major papers on hydroxychloroquine have been retracted um, yes. because of the fast tracking of the peer review process. And Correct as soon as they were published you know alarm bells were being raised so it wasn't as though there was something not obvious that was missed something was missed so but even okay. even if we look at the literature uh, not the coronavirus literature but the literature specific to you know chill blain like lesions and coronavirus we've still had an awful lot in a small period of time so i mean i saw just a couple of weeks ago there's a systematic review on it um 
and now systematic reviews uh, you know take months well we did a systematic review once it took us two years just to do the review for a condition that we didn't really have any awareness yeah. of in three months we've become aware of an association we've had enough work published and a systematic review the time to do the review itself just seems like we're on a crazy t i think i'm probably jealous that it takes us so long in the musculoskeletal world to get stuff published um but it just seems like an absolute crazy time the paper we are going to lean on for we're going to if it's okay just take a bit of a journey through the some of this research and you can sort of speak to some of the interesting things and and the, the go into a bit more depth the paper we're going to lean on is the i'm going to get this wrong i think massey and jones paper which was in seminars in oncology published just a few weeks ago in may craig have you got the yeah. published a lovely timeline again it's it's already out of date it was published in may 2020 and, it, and here we are mid-june and it's already out of date um but could we just, well, perhaps we should start with the um, the Mazzotti paper, which first was certainly the first one on my radar, which was the, the sort of Spanish paper that reported these lesions in, in children. Could we start there and just you give us a bit of a journey through the research as you've been observing it? Well, so obviously this research caught all of our eyes, especially as podiatrists, because we, we, we work with a foot. But with COVID, we, we initially thought it was a, a lung disease. It, you know, the, the virus attached, attached to the lungs and it caused pneumonia. And from the, the, the clinical foot manifestations or the chilblain-like lesions in asymptomatic people, we quickly came to realize that we're not dealing with a lung condition here. We're actually dealing with a blood-related disorder or, or virus, if, if you want to put it that way. So I think that's why Mazzotti's paper, it was the first one that I also shared with, with my colleagues here in South Africa, um, that really brought to light that we, we don't know the tip of the iceberg when it comes to coronavirus and what it actually does. Subsequently to that, we've realized that um, COVID attaches to uh, your, your red blood cells and it takes away oxygen in your red blood cells and it causes the cytokine storm that everyone keeps on referring to, which is basically an inflammatory condition and these manifestations in the foot and the lesions, we can talk a little bit about that in depth later, but um, it causes an inflammatory condition in the, 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 the blood vessels and obviously your capillaries or your micro vessels will be the first gets affected so craig correct me on the timeline because i'm i'm not as well read at this what we had the the spanish paper that talked certainly i recall when it first the spanish paper was first sort of spread around here by the mm -hmm. by the mainstream media it was all talk, yeah. it was always talking about children 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 at what mm -hmm. point was the first paper that that brought in that it wasn't just children that were being affected uh, where was that in the timeline i'm just looking now there was it was oh, around april the 9th april the 10th is when the first first hit the news media um oh end of april there's uh the per kilo paper 24th of april um 63 patients of all age groups so yeah so within 10 days it was you know first being reported in kids then within 10 days there was publications out there spreading it around in, in, in a wider wider population cool. yeah so, so nadia the, the totality of the evidence we have right now what's it telling us about um at risk groups so we is it still more prevalent in in children or, or is it the different demographic that seem to be manifesting it so we have two st distinct patient demographics the one will be the children which we know COVID doesn't really affect them in terms of severity so their lesions or their their foot lesions their their chilblain like lesions are relatively mild and they start prior to any symptoms or no symptoms at all only a quarter of reported children cases actually develop the sore throat the lack of taste lack of smell headache that type of thing so you will get the asymptomatic type of lesion in in the children and in your vulnerable groups, which we know are the elderly and the diabetics, you will get these lesions about two to three days after symptoms or diagnosis of COVID, and it's normally pretty severe. And they don't form chilblain-like lesions, they, they form acro-ischemic lesions, 
where they either develop necrosis, gangrene, or if, if the patient um, doesn't survive, they, they pass away. And we, the clinical manifestations, we spent quite a bit of time last night with Joseph talking about, you know, what, we, what we'd expect to see in clinic that would raise our suspicion we had a, a chill brain. If we, I, I, I don't know if the term COVID toes is, is a bit crude to use, but I'll use that term just to, to separate. If we had a, you know, a classic chill brain and a classic COVID toe, how, how similar or different are they? Are they, are they easy to distinguish when you know what you're looking for? Absolutely no distinguish a signs between which makes it extremely difficult so if, if you take it from a south african perspective we are now entering a chill lane season um so it's extremely difficult to diagnose whether it is or it isn't a COVID toe. so what we've put out there is to to tell our, our colleagues you know unfortunately you have to suspect COVID if you see a chill blame like lesion in the foot or in the hands, unless you get a, a negative COVID result from that patient, you don't know whether it is a normal chill blame or whether it is a COVID toe. The one thing that might distinguish it from the, the, the other is to ask your, your history, of course, that we, we always do, um, and, and that is to, to make sure that the patient hasn't had any cold exposure, not freezing temperatures, but a cold exposure and then a rapid warm up of, of that digit. If, if that's the case, you would likely be dealing with a chill brain. Otherwise, you wouldn't know. So in a history yeah. taking, sorry, go on, Craig. Yeah, look, I was just going to say, I, th I think it's also to keep in mind that um, when COVID-19 first had its outbreak, the Northern Hemisphere was in chill brain season. We're in down here. We were not in chill blain season. Now we are in, now in chill blain season down here. So we're starting to see these chill blains. So I don't know how much that factored into it. I know that like the first reports were coming out of Spain, which don't necessarily have a lot of chill blains anyway. Um, but yeah, I think that, and I, I do like Nadia's <coughs> comment about the, the chill blains that are being seen in COVID nineteen are no different to the chill blains seen anything else. I mean, these are chill blains. It's just yeah. they have seem to have a very very high prevalence in COVID-19. So we, you know, we talk about spurious correlations. I've seen a brilliant one, you know, previously, which talked about the amount of people that, that watch Nicolas Cage films and the amount of people that die in swimming pools, you know, th things, things yeah. in life sometimes just correlate, don't they? But this, so what, what we're saying here is we, we had a, an outbreak of a, of a novel virus at the time that we'd have probably been getting a lot of chill blains in the Northern hemisphere anyway, but that aside there, there, is there any debate that there is a, a strong link here? You know, what, what's the what, what's the sort of proposed reasoning behind the association? So the proposed reasoning behind the association is exactly that that cytokine storm. And now we know that we can't treat patients with a cytokine storm because they die because of anti-inflammatories or, or steroids that we give them. Um, the recovery trial that just came out a couple of days ago now gives us a little bit of hope for the ventilated and oxygenated patients because you can actually give dexamethasone to them and they the recovery rate is quite well. But in terms of the debate, um, we've, we've, I've seen a lot of, of information and in research that these got a lot of feedback there. Yeah, no, no, that was me. I fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I've seen in, in, in literature is that it's it's the, the, the skin manifestation is, is, is very under appreciated. So we are focusing on treating patients, making sure that they don't get oxygenated or ventilated, they're quarantined, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But we're not focusing on the skin manif manifestations which means that the reporting of it is not as good as it actually should be. And then to come back to your question is the inflammatory cytokine storm, the only differentiation that we see currently is through histology. So you'll still see your um, normal histological inflammatory leukocytes and neutrophils and, and um, apoptosis, necrosis, all of that. But the one thing that it separates the COVID chill brain from the others is a microstomy. So you get a microaneurysm somewhere along the line, and we've, we've also seen an, an increase of reports for young people 
my age, a little bit older, a little bit younger, that get strokes, heart attacks because of the uh, clotting. There's a, there's a great linkage in a clotting factor and fibrinogen. So that's, that's where the debate is going, but unfortunately, the, the information is still relatively new, so we have to develop it as we go along. Actually, just re remind me, Nadia, has anyone published on the uh, any histology on chillblains and in COVID nineteen? Yes. Is that yes? And, and that, they were they were they, how different were they? Uh, they were quite different. Sorry, I made a note. Can I just read my note? So I did make a note. So um, excuse me, I, I can't remember who the the authors were, but I can share the link to sure, yeah. the, the the paper if you want. Um, so what they found on histology was your lymph lympho lymphocytic infiltrates and your periocrine involvement, vacuolar interface, and scattered necrotic keratinocytes. So basically, that that's normal for 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 any type of vascular involvement. Yeah. But what they found was the focal thrombi, and it's not characteristic of any chillblain lesion ever seen. So that. I think that paper was published probably about two or three weeks ago, and they they took active uh, four millimeter punch biopsies from the toes specifically because we're podiatrists, and that's what they found on histology. Okay, so that, so there is there is a difference. There is a difference. Oh, where's that? Yeah. Oh, where's that so are you guys getting feedback, or is it just me? Yeah, it's, just no, me. It's, no. It's, it's, it's only when you speak, though, Craig. It sounds like you're in a cave. <laughs> yeah. okay. How, how's that? How's that? That's, That's better. better. Yeah, yeah. Sorry yeah, about yeah. that. Yeah. So, okay, so the, the point I make. So there, so there is a difference in the histology. Perhaps saying, well, there maybe there is something different in the pathophysiology. The Everything yeah. else is characteristic of a chill name, but the yeah. microtrauma is the one thing that they've so what, now. Where would what would that microtrauma be? Um, well, it's because of the the clotting factors. So what yeah. we know. COVID now is it increases um, clotting and current anticoagulants are not really working. That's too date. So you know you can't hold me to that. Um, so anticoagulants are not working and we're getting increased thrombi and, and platelet aggregation. Um, it's something that's never been seen before. I know that a couple of uh, pathologists and histologists have commented to say that the, the, the amount of clotting and the way that the platelet aggregation sits is something that they've never seen before. Okay, yeah, and I, like, that, like that's interesting because the, the 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 thing that I sort of try to get my head around is is that is COVID nineteen the 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 cytokine storm and the pathophysiology of that just a risk factor for chillblain. So they're just getting a normal regular chillblain. Um, they're just more prone to them. So it's not actually part of the mm -hmm. pathophysiological process. But given that the histology is actually showing something in there that yes. indicates that it potentially is part of the pathophysiological process. Yeah, that, that's what makes it so fascinating. One day you think it's one thing and the next day you think it's something else. And especially, you know, as a podiatrist who, who loves dealing with diabetic patients and, and blood disorders and blood problems, this is fascinating that we're seeing this as part of a pathophysiology. Yeah, sure. Now we just on this. We just had a question from Belinda about whether um, focal thrombi is an inflammatory marker. But do the histo reports uh, you've seen have anything to suggest that there might be viral particles within the cutaneous lesions? They haven't commented on that. No, so in the research, I can't comment, unfortunately. Yeah, I would have. I, 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 I'm just guessing here. I, I would have thought that in the histological studies, they would have looked for that. And if they didn't comment, that's probably because they didn't find them. Maybe I don't. I don't I, I'm, I'm guessing, but yeah. And that that might be the one thing. Or the other thing is, it might still be in print. They're still mm. their research and delving deeper into into what uh, we currently see. Because again, we see something today, and then we take that and we build on it. I mean, just on on the PhD proposal, I had to take a, a lot of my information out because uh, publications have been pulled out, um, you know, they've been rejected and then new information comes in. So every single day you get new information. So I'm sure that they, they are still busy trying to isolate the viral particles. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, I don't actually know how easy or hard that is to do in histology. So, yeah. <laughs> no, no, me neither. I mean, 
Thank heavens I work with people and not with cells. <laughs> from uh, from a just a pragmatic clinical approach, what mm -hmm. we what I'm what I'm taking from this, and call me out on it if I've misinterpreted, is that. A bit like we touched on yesterday, you'd see a skin lesion and, and the history is key and king, so to speak. So if you saw one of those classic sort of risk factors, so the, you know, the female sex, low body mass index, history of exposure to cold, and you saw one of these lesions, you, your mm -hmm. index of uh, a kill blame would be raised. If we, we talked last night about, um, I know you watched last night, we talked about if yeah. we had a, a middle-aged, overweight male who, who had had no cold exposure, what would we be thinking? And Joseph said, we'd be thinking about some other systemic thing. At what point um, do we start thinking, or do is it appropriate to see something which doesn't, which looks like a chill blend but doesn't fit? And, and I've, I've certainly seen people immediately on the internet see a lesion and say, coronavirus. Clearly that, yeah. that, that, that can't be... The, the, the way to do this what's the what's the clinically reasoned approach that you would advise our, our audience who are sort of sitting in clinic perhaps seeing uh, particularly up here in the northern hemisphere seeing these kind of lesions at this time how do they reason through this 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 sort of uh, this these woods so i mean obviously this is just my 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 personal opinion um there are no cdc guidelines yet they they are considering putting uh a COVID toe symptom, or the colloquialism of COVID toe, to put an screening tool. So, um, in in terms of that, there actually isn't any screening tool or for you to to consider it being a, a COVID toe. But if you just look at at the demographic, so again, I'm going to speak about South Africa because our numbers are rising quite rapidly. And if an elderly gentleman walks in here. Um, the, the type of gentleman that you described and my history would be do you have any COVID related symptoms uh, yes or no really doesn't give me any indication of, of whether he actually has the virus or not temperature I don't know what you guys are doing in, in your parts of the world but we screen for for low-grade fever and any patient that walks into the practice with, with a fever of 37.3 to 37.5, I know, you know, it differs from country to country. I immediately put them and send them for a coronavirus test. And then obviously exposure to people. You are supposed to now currently with all the lockdown regulations, you should be self isolating you should only be doing the necessary. But if you went out in a couple of days ago, you went for to get yourself some milk and bread, and then all of a sudden this type of symptom appears, and it's not within that uh, patient demographic of, of a, a normal children, you would be quite suspected. And with your kids, with us now sending children back to school, if the children is self-isolating at home because they are of the grades that are not going to school, it's probably a children. If it's a child exposed to other children and being outside in the world, then that would be the first idea that it is a carbon Actually, just, just while you were talking, I just did a quick search, Nadia. So I was just a bit intrigued about the false negative rate for testing. Yes. And I've just found a study from a week ago that's put it as high as 38%. Mm -hmm. You know, so look, it's <laughs> that's yeah, well, 38% are, false, false yeah, negative sorry. rate. False negative rates is huge. And yeah. the one that... that uh, We've added to the guidelines here in South Africa, you, I don't want to lie to you, I think three or four weeks ago, was it's, you won't normally get a fever or um, a, a sore throat or, or runny nose that, that, that they've, uh, the, the, the a world, excuse, world Health Regulations guidelines gives you. It's actually, if you have no sense of smell and no sense of taste, sure fire, you should be isolating yourself completely. Yeah. Uh, because you you probably have coronavirus, and those patients come back with a with a negative test. Yeah, I should qualify that thirty eight by thirty eight percent of the study did actually say it depends when during the natural history is that test done. So yeah. if it's done done early, it might be much higher than when if it's done a little bit later. But it's still, you know, if you just um, you know cross sectional send someone off for a test, you know, yeah, and again that that and that. There may be a different testing um, kit or something used in different countries, which may have better rates. You know, but that was still 
Um, actually, look, I just want to make one comment. You, you just did, you did mention something about the CDC might be considering putting out guidelines for this. I, I, it just intrigues me because I know when I speak to North American colleagues, and I, I especially those in Southern California, and I use the word chillblains, they go, what? <laughs> you know, so so to to a lot of them, this is actually something quite new. I mean, to those of us who have spent years in, in well, where, where I'm in Melbourne and Christchurch, New Zealand, you know, chillblains is a regular thing. Um, this yes. is something we're used to seeing, but to, to and, and so if the CDC is going to put out some sort of guidance in North America, America, I can understand why because it is something <laughs> they, just don't, they just don't see, you know. <laughs> yeah, so so it depends on the type of colleague, obviously. So yeah. sorry, Ian, I see you want to say something. No, um, you go, you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's obviously your your podiatry colleagues are not generally the ones on the front line. I mm. know of and probably one or two others that are actively involved in, in testing and screening patients where mm -hmm. uh, your colleagues would just go on with their normal day. Um, it's more your, your frontline uh, doctors and even dermatologists who are pushed into the frontline because of, of the amount of patients that they see. Those are the ones that you actually need to speak to because they, they have spoken about um, this in a CDC guideline. I haven't seen any guidelines yet. But again, the publication came out two weeks ago. Yeah, actually, probably also should clarify clarify with regard to dermatologists. There are other skin lesions that are being reported in COVID nineteen, yes. not, not just the chillblains, you know, on other yes. parts of the body. So it's a, it's obviously a risk factor for more than just a, a, a chillblain. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Could we could we go back to the the evidence we have the the, the published work we have on mm -hmm. on chillblains and chillblain like lesions and and you know, or COVID, COVID toes, whatever they're referring to it as. Of the 15, 16 papers, I probably missed some. There's probably 20 now. Um, I've seen varying uh, percentages given with regard to its sort of uh, its incidence. So in some, it's like, I think there was 20% of this this group or 63% of hospital, this, this hospitalized group had a skin manifestation. What's your, um, what's your take on, on you know, uh, the sort of numbers we're probably looking at here? Or again, is, is it variable? It's extremely variable at the moment because we're not looking for these skin lesions. Um, so I've also seen some published work with a 20% with of 88 patients. Um, so it's only about 18 patients that have a skin lesion or a chillblain like lesion. We're not talking about the rest of them. Um, there are other lesions as well that we're looking out for. Um, but there are incidences of 40%. Of, of patients who are, who are tested positive, who have chillblain-like lesions, along with a host of others, and some even report 80%. So it's extremely variable. That I think it honestly depends on what you are looking for. It does feel like one of those subjects where it's 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 interesting and, and, and fascinating to talk about it and be in the middle of it all as it's emerging, but it feels mm -hmm. like fast forwards however long whether it be months or probably years it will be looking back on it that we can look at it all and sort of real really make sense of it do you think that's makes fair sense. absolutely absolutely because what you think you know today and you think you're the expert today tomorrow you are at the bottom of the totem pole and you have to start all over again um so it's extremely difficult in an in an emerging and a very novel virus like this um, your, your, your data that you collect is extremely dependent on what you're looking for. Some people are looking for uh, some are looking still at, at, at the, the lungs, what's happening in the lungs. People are looking at skin manifest manifestations. And the only reason skin manifestations popped up is exactly because dermatologists were put in the front line. It wasn't a podiatrist who first saw a skin lesion on the foot, it was a dermatologist. And that was in, in, in Spain and Italy because they were forced into the front line. So unfortunately, probably five, ten years from now, we'll look back and say, we should have seen this, we should have seen that. But in the mix, you, you, you know, farting in the wind, if I can put it that way. <laughs> yeah, sure. Now, again, while we're talking, let me just share this. I just quickly did a um, Google News search for COVID toes. And yeah. I think something else, one thing, another thing that's driving this is the popular media latched onto it. And mm -hmm. in Google News, there's 1,160,000 
results for Goodness. COVID toes. That you know the news media really sort of latched latched onto this, e either appropriately or not. But that has sort of raised mm -hmm. it in everyone's everyone's consciousness, um, which, which may or might not necessarily be a good thing. And that is exactly why you will find uh, laymen or colleagues, as soon as they see a, a chill blame like lesion, which is extremely normal this time of year in the southern hemisphere, your alarm bell will go off because it's, it's, it's a popular media trend at the moment. And I, I can't tell you why it's only the toes instead of all the other skin rashes and exanthems that we get with any viral um, infection. But the, the COVID toe thing just, I think it's because of the colloquialism of, of COVID toes that. Sure. Yeah. sure. Now, I, I did actually make a comment a moment ago about the other dermatological manifestations. We just had a question from Veronica. What, what are some of those other dermatological manifestations other than COVID toes that do seem to okay, happen so with increased frequency? That's not my field. I wrote it down. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we get an er erythematous rash over the entire body, especially in children. You don't see a lot of it um, in, in the elderly population. This is what to do with children. Um, Uticaria and exanthema, which is basically like your Carposi syndrome. A, a lot of people have mentioned that you see the, the typical viral rash that you would see with Carposi syndrome. But those are the things that they, they've been finding in children. Luckily, I Either, so. Yeah, but I, I mean, I may embarrass myself here, and I'm far from being any sort of expert in dermatology. But I, my, my guess or speculation, you know, some of the pathophysiological processes that happen in COVID nineteen are similar to the risk factors for those other skin conditions. So they're just occurring with more frequency. Um, and I, I just to so, say so those skin conditions that have, um, I don't know the the vascular reactivity as a risk factor, they're going to show it with more frequency. And, and it shows you that somewhere along the line, we are now seeing that this is a virus that irritates the inflammatory process and it irritates the oxygenation process and the fact that we cannot, um, uh, we clot more than what we should. So it's something to do with, with inflammation. Uh, what it's obviously, just as a lowly podiatrist, I, I, I can't tell you all of the, the um, pathophysiological traits that, that are happening, but it's something to do with, with inflammation and exactly that. Uticaria is a classic sign of inflammation. Xanthema is Actually, inflammation. Yeah. Sure. Actually, my ears really picked up when you said that oxygen, oxygenation word. I've just, I haven't, and I apologize, I haven't read this, but I've just saved them to read and have scanned them. Um, yeah. Some studies done on, on well, not studies, but more commentary on athletes who have got mm -hmm. COVID-19 and just how fatigued and tired they are when they recover. I mean, this is a, a, a you know, athletes coming back to sport, it's going to be, uh, it's, it seems to be really bad, like worse than any other sort of like a, a flu or any other sort of viral infection. Um, it, it's, it's, and that's obviously the, the assumption is that would be the reason why. Absolutely. And uh, there's one study published Again, please don't ask me the names. I read them every day. Um, is that 10 to 20 percent of recovered patients, and this is not now speaking about athletes, it's just in, in the general population who had COVID, um, have myocardial uh, problems because of COVID. And obviously, that has to do it also has to do something again because it's the heart has to do with the blood. It has to do with the oxygen that gets transported through the body. Sure. Um, we've just had another question, just sort of moving the topic off, off that slightly, about when does the COVID toast symptoms occur during the disease process, early, late? Um, so with, with your children, they are asymptomatic. So that will just pop up probably day two or three of infection, but they don't know they have COVID because they don't have the concomitant symptoms. Um, and this spontaneous result spontaneously resolves itself within 12 to 20 days. That's, that's reported case. And when it comes to your elderly population, this is post-diagnosis. So probably around day 10. If they develop symptoms, they develop it between day 10, day 12, where they're basically almost over the stint of, of being infected with COVID. Well, I also assume well, I also that might... Assume Oh, what's happening oh, what's again? Happening Sorry, again. again. <laughs> There's absolutely no reason no for reason it. reason for it. 
<laughs> okay, I'll just, okay, I'll, I'll just, quiet. I'll be quiet. Probably my electric personality. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you, well, you let, carry on. Uh, I'll try and talk this out. Let me, uh, let me jump in while Craig's sorting out his microphone. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you a bit about your PhD because what, what's clear is that we've got more and more data and evidence emerging, and that's going to continue. And as we said, that's a good thing because then we can look back when the, when the time is right. You're going to be part of contributing to that. Before I ask you to give us a bit of an insight as to what you're going to be looking at and how you're going to be looking at it, could I, I, I just want to ask you, I, I certainly remember reading something of yours, a biog of yours, years ago, well, mm-hmm. certainly, it certainly predates coronavirus. It was when you were at a conference you were speaking at, I saw. Yeah. And, and, it, and even there it said, you know, has aspirations to study, I think you, you had your master's, you has aspirations to study a PhD. So I, I'm assuming you wanted to do a PhD before you'd even heard of coronavirus. And now you're doing your PhD on coronavirus. Now, was there a sudden U-turn? Were you looking for a good idea and this came along? Or what were you going to do your PhD on if, you know, at the end of 2019? Mm-hmm. Oh, Ian, that's a difficult question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I always wanted to do my PhD. I've always had aspirations to do a PhD. Don't ask me why, because it doesn't bring you any money. It doesn't bring you anything. It just, it's, it's something that I wanted to do. So originally my plan was to uh, start studying podiatric surgery at Glasgow Caledonia next year, 2021. And as COVID came along, Nadia was just sitting, reading, you know, doing her thing, saw something of a chill brain, and then she thought, let me just quickly send a WhatsApp to my professor, who was my professor for my master's degree. And I uh, have you heard of COVID toes? You know, this whole process, no, send me something. And it was within a day that I sent her my, my, my PhD uh, two-pager and then methodology that I was thinking about. And that same day I got my co-supervisor, Dr. Bernard Zipfel, he's, he's watching now. And yes, it just happened within two days. It was, it was actually just, it just came as a fluke because it's novel. <laughs> that's great and and we know that phd proposals uh they evolve as as, as you go yes. on the first, the first draft you put in is never what you end up doing so and, and obviously i i don't want to ask uh, you to give away any information you're not happy to give away but uh as much as you're happy to tell us could you give us an idea of what what your proposal is at this stage and what you're going to be looking for how you're going to be contributing to the literature and and, and the sort of methodology that you're going to sort of be employing so what I want to find out, obviously we don't have a lot of publications from South Africa and especially podiatry colleagues don't, don't publish. I mean, it's, it just is what it is. I can't tell you why. Um, so my reasoning is if it has something to do with the foot or the blood supply, um, we have to see how we as podiatrists can contribute. So what I'm looking for is to see that the number one, do we follow the same pattern in South Africa as the the world is doing? Do we get any chillblain like lesions or no? If it's no, then we don't have a PhD anymore. Then we just write it up and send it on its way. (laughs) If we do, I would like to see the different demographics, Um, you know, because I've I've also seen reported cases where people don't focus on your, your, your black population because of the darker skin color. So they just hoi it out the window and, and don't look for, for any um, children like lesions. So I want to see the demographic then in South Africa. So that would be more of a data collection process. And then hopefully as the PhD goes along some type of intervention, which is the one part that I'm stuck with at the moment because there ain't no intervention anywhere for anything. But but Nadia, but surely if there is a cure for COVID nineteen on the horizon, you, you'd better get a move on. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, we 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 all we all want this thing gone. We all want we all want <laughs> yes. to see the back of this. Perhaps except you. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, but, uh, but, but that's the thing that we. But I think the thing is here, like here in Australia, they're starting some vaccine trials. But we've got the incident rate down so low, I have no idea how they're going to do these trials. <laughs> you know, people have to get sick to, to do the trials, you know. A good, they can send it to South Africa. We, we, yeah. we, 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 we're at 80,000 uh, cases today. So when we're climbing, we haven't even started with the peak yet. So send it our way. 
<laughs> that's a good problem to have craig so you're going to be recruiting you talk me through your recruitment process so you're going to be sort of recruiting people that have been confirmed di diagnosed with coronavirus is that have i got that right twofold yes and no so i would I would ideally like it as part of a screening protocol because you don't have that. Uh, because I'm, I'm on the front line and I do screen, that's one thing that we're not looking for because in a, in a, in a, a community health clinic where there are 700, 800 people waiting to see a doctor, you don't necessarily go and ask each and every one to take their, their shoes and socks off. So it will be twofold to see if we are following the trends of younger children uh, being asymptomatic and having um, a COVID lesion. So to screen for a COVID lesion prior to diagnosis and then diagnose patients. What I would ideally like to do is myself go to the severely um, uh, infected patients, those on oxygenation and ventilation, whether they are showing the acromyschemic lesions as well. But this will to be a nationwide study so I'll probably spearhead it here in Gauteng and Joburg and then recruit colleagues to, to do the same in other provinces. Yeah. Actually just, just just one little side question that just occurred to me are these COVID toes, chilblain lesions on toes, where do they stand in the um, scale of symptoms? Are they really causing a lot of problems for these people? Or are they just like incidental findings? Or No, no, it's honestly just an incidental finding because it's annoying. It's mm. just a, it's a little bit painful. But it's not that I saw this and this is this is what what causes me to, to have a concern about COVID. No, it's just incidental. Mm. Cool. Okay. Well, I, I, well I, sat, I, I sat... Oh, I, oh I've got feedback now. I've got feedback now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm I'm puzzled by the scene. By the scene. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was about to wrap up anyway, so I was about to say I, I'm sure I'm not the only person excited by uh, any any literature in this area. I've been I, again; it's not my area of specialism. I don't see these kind of patients really. I, I've not been in clinic for 14 weeks, but it's just nice to sit on the sidelines and just see something relative to the foot sort of evolve and emerge. So kind of excited that you're going to be a part of it, Nadia. Maybe in a few years' time, um, you'll come back on and. Uh, and uh, tell us how it all went. Oh, absolutely. I'm hoping for that. And I'm hoping not to just finish the PhD after a quick little, uh, uh, to see, oh, no, we're not following trends. So let's just, let's can it. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, is there anything off the comments no. that we need to touch on? No, that, that's all. I've put them all up. So, look, so th thanks so much, Nadia. Um, it's wow. been really interesting. It's, it's obviously a topical topic. We have had a lot of people watching. For those of you who've joined late, please come back in 10 minutes. You'll see the video um, from the beginning. It'll be up on YouTube soon. So thanks so much for watching. Um, thanks, Nadia. Thanks, thanks Nadia, Thank for coming on board. <laughs>